or from the cold to the warm, but my sinuses are bothering me. I can hear everybody else kind of <clears throat> sniffling and choking and coughing. And so uh, I'm not I'm not quite ready for spring yet. I'd like another snow here and get some snow in here before uh, springtime. But uh, go, away. go away, I've been told. Okay. <laughs> If you'll turn in your uh, Bibles to the book of Philippians, I've, I've simply called this sermon Provisions from Philippians. The points, uh, the major points of this sermon are not unique to me. In fact, uh, you, it's possible that uh, you have heard a sermon similar to this. All the points come from the book of Philippians, obviously and deal with the provisions that are made by Jesus for us uh, today. And as Christians, uh, we are blessed to have all these provisions and needs taken care of. The book of Philippians informs us and and provides for us a a clear path of what it means to be a, a Christian just as in the context of the New Testament, we, are, we find that Christianity is not something that is, uh, something that is uh, a, an occasional act. It is a continual lifestyle. And being that it is a continual lifestyle, the needs, uh, the needs and the things that we, we, uh, we have want for obviously are always going to be there. And so the book of Philippians gives us a good little outline of all the things that have been provided for us to make sure that we can stay on that Christian path. That God does require for us to be a Christian and live a lifestyle, live a life of Christianity, not just be Christian-like once in a while, but to be a Christian and to live the life of a Christian And for that purpose, we see in the book of Philippians kind of an outline of how he makes sure that we have everything we need to do that. And so Jesus has provided us everything that we need from beginning to end. And that makes sense because if, if God wanted this to be an entire life change and then to be a life lived, not something that's just occasionally practiced, then God will give us everything that we need to do it, and he did. And one of the reasons that it is, is good to, do, to look at this is because it's all very neatly in that one book of Philippians. And so for us, it should serve as edification and, and uplift us as we live the Christian life, but it should also be a reminder in the back of our heads that when we, when we run into individuals who are not Christians, that we can look to the book of Philippians and find some, <laughs> some points along the way. This outline might stick in your head because it's all in the book of Philippians. And you might not remember where something is in the Bible, but you might remember that there are four points in the book of Philippians that we can look to to help people see the necessity of Christianity, the blessings of Christianity, and, and the, the, the idea of it being a lifestyle and not just something that is occasionally practiced. And as I pointed out, the main points are not unique to me, but obviously they come directly from the text. So we begin in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, where it has been said that Jesus provides here the purpose of life. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We are here given the purpose of life, what it means to be a Christian and why we are here. We are here to serve the living God. We are here to obey Christ. We are here to to follow the example that Jesus has set before us. And that in living that life, we have hope of eternal life. That to live in in such a way as to be faithful to Christ that we might gain what has been promised to us through living through Christ. 
The great preacher of Ecclesiastes said, for the whole purpose of man is this, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And many today look through all manner of self-help books to find out what the meaning of life is, and God has told us what the meaning of life is. God loved us, and he has provided us with everything that we need to live and be sustained on this earth, but he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are here to re reciprocate that great love that uh, Brother Kevin pointed out this morning in our Bible class. God loves us, and for that reason we should reciprocate that love through obedience to him. For That's how we show our love to God, through obedience to God. So the Christian life, the purpose of the Christian life is to fear God and keep his commandments. To live is to live for Christ and, and therefore to die is to gain. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, the Bible tells us that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things, those other uh, physical blessings of life would follow. To seek first the kingdom of God is to put God first in our lives and therefore the church that was established by God and purchased by the blood of Christ, Acts 20 and verse 28, should be first and foremost in our life. It should not be an afterthought. The church was definitely not an afterthought to Jesus. He died for it. He purchased it with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 7. And uh, he uh, is the king over that kingdom, right? He sits on the right hand of God right now. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 3, as the king over his kingdom. And so the church was not something that was seen as uh, just something to do on Sundays or, or Wednesdays. It was part of the whole process. It was part of the Christian life. It's who we are. And that's why he said it should be number one in our priority list. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, those two Things go hand in hand, obviously. If you know how to be pleasing to God, you're going to be an individual who God adds to his church. Because the kingdom and his righteousness cannot be separated. They are connected. So Jesus provides here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, the purpose of life. In the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus provides for us a pattern. So we have the purpose, and now we have a pattern. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we've been given a pattern by Jesus to follow. There are those in the world who do not like the idea of patterns or examples, but the Bible is full of patterns and examples. One of the very uh, first uh, examples that is given to us in Hebrews chapter 11 that reflects back to the very beginning is that of Cain and Abel, that we are to follow the example of Abel and not that of Cain. But that of Cain was an example of disobedience and that of Abel was an example of righteousness. And so the Hebrews writer tells us that it was faith that led Abel to be right with God. That Abel did what he did because he loved God. He understood the purpose of life and that he followed the pattern that he did what God told him to do and so we here are told to follow that same pattern the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ has been revealed to us in the word that when we read it we can understand it and we can obey it and when we read the word of God when we read the word of Christ we have the mind of Christ Jesus not only died for us, but he lived for us too. He lived to show us what it was like to fulfill the Father's will. That's what he said he came to do, right? I came to fulfill the Father's will. I came to do my Father's will. And he showed us how that was done. In fact, he was the only man who sinlessly, perfectly followed the will of the Father. That made him the sinless, perfect son, son of God and the sinless lamb that was able to, to take away sin. 
a sinless lamb of God that uh, otherwise did not exist previous to that. The blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. But the blood of Christ could because he not only died, he lived. He lived it. And so we have a pattern in how Jesus lived. He set for us an example, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. He did all these things to give us an example. He modeled for us what it was like to be Christian, right? To be Christ-like because He is Christ. He didn't just tell us what to do. He showed us how to do it. There are a lot of personal qualities that we can find in Jesus. And the sad thing is that some people pick and choose which qualities they like about Jesus and only emphasize those. But there are many good qualities of Jesus. We need to apply them all to our life. We need to follow all of their example, not just some, but all. He gave us examples on love and mercy and grace, forgiveness and obedience, compassion, love for the lost, but also a disdain and a distaste for for that which was against his Father's will. These are qualities that we need to add to our lives, that we need to possess And therefore, Jesus has set for us a pattern, a pattern to follow. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, we find that Jesus provides a prize. That for those who recognize the purpose of life, and follow the pattern that Jesus has set before us, there remains a prize. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize here, obviously, is that of eternal life, that of heaven, that of that great rest that awaits us after this life. That was why Paul lived. That was... Why Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's why he said this mind, the mind of Christ, needs to be in me. It needs to permeate me. It needs to be who I am. It needs to uh, be expressed in how I live and shown in what I do. And so he presses toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God. We are called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. The individual, such as Paul, being the instrument God used to call us. Writing down these inspired words to guide us towards heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 14, that one of his purposes was to prepare a place for those that would be obedient to him. He says, Let not your heart be troubled, verse 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And whither I go, you know, and, and the way. You know. So Jesus has prepared a place, an eternal home for those who are obedient to Him. It's important, therefore, to recognize that this goal, that this prize, belongs to Christ, and it is in Christ only that this blessing can be found. That point is seen from purpose to pattern, to prize. For Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ. And in Philippians 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Therefore, when he says in Philippians 3, verse 14, that he pressed toward the goal of the high calling of God, which was in Christ. The high calling of God in Christ. The prize has a residence, just as the, the salvation that we have is, has a residence. It's in Christ. 
The Bible tells us how to achieve this great calling and to, to receive the blessings of this high calling through obedience to the gospel by hearing the call and obeying it. That call culminates in water baptism, for that's the only way that the New Testament tells us that we can get into Christ. And since being in Christ is where the prize is, being in Christ is where salvation is, and being in Christ is therefore necessary for us to enjoy that prize. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 4, Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So the aspect of being buried with Christ, being planted with Christ, verse 5, and being raised to walk in newness of life, all come from obedience, which culminates in water baptism. This is further seen when Paul told the church at Galatia. In Galatians chapter 3. Verse 26, Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So the purpose of life is in Christ. The pattern of life is that the mind of Christ, that that mind which is in Christ should be in us. And the prize of Christ, the prize of the high calling of God, is also in Christ. And that to become a child of God by faith, we must be in Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The inspired writer here pointing out the fact that yes, we might have physical differences, but spiritually we follow the same one God, we follow the same one pattern, and we all enjoy the same one prize. And so for this reason, Paul found himself wanting to live for that prize. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Recognizing the high calling of God, Paul wanted to follow the pattern, and he recognized that that pattern was his purpose in life. In Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. If the prize that we are looking for is in heaven, then it is in heaven that we must focus our eyes. Heaven should be our goal. And to place anything in this life in front of that goal is only to set before ourselves obstacles and stumbling blocks. So if it is the case that we are following the pattern that Jesus has given for us, and our goal, our eyes are focused on the prize that God has provided for us, our purpose would be to live as Christ lived. <laughs> right? And so all of these points are interconnected they're interconnected. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Jesus asked the question, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Many people have chosen to exchange any treasures in the future life for all the things that they can garner in this life. They have chosen any small amount of gain in this physical life and have rejected the prize of the high calling of God. 
They choose some other purpose. They follow some other pattern. And they receive some other reward. They do not receive the reward of the high calling of God because they do not seek to live as Christ. They do not seek to let the mind of Christ be in them. And they do not press toward the goal of the high calling of God. They press toward the God of this life. So some might look at the purpose of life and the pattern of life and the prize of life and recognize that at least in the prize of life there is motivation to follow the pattern and to accept the purpose that we have been given. But God doesn't leave off there. God doesn't leave us without any other additional support. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus provides power. Jesus provides power. Power that helps us to accept the purpose, follow the pattern, and live for the goal, the prize. Paul said in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In John chapter 15, <clears throat> John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The power, the power that we need to accept the purpose, to receive the purpose, to follow the pattern, and to set our guise and our goal on the prize. When Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches, it, necess it necessitates obligation on our part. In verse 2 of chapter 15, he says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit will be taken away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Then in verse 10, he tells us what it means to abide in him. He tells us what it means to abide in the vine. He tells us where this nutrition, this power from the, for the branches to live and to do comes from. Right? Except you abide in me, he says, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. We can't have the nutrition we need to survive as Christians without the Christ. We can't have the, the necessities of Christiana, Christian life without Him. And in verse 10, He explains what that means. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Jesus tells us that to be a branch, we have to know His will and do it. That we have to know His commandments and keep His commandments. That's what it means to be a branch in the vine. Those who hear the Word of God and do not believe it are not branches. <coughs> They're not branches in the vine. Those who do not believe, obviously, therefore, are not branches because those who do not believe are not going to do either. But the sad thing is, those who believe and then do, but then fall away, are cut off, verse 2. Because they stop doing, they stop obeying the commandments of God, and they stop abiding. And when you stop abiding, you stop receiving that nutrition. And the nutrition is the commands of God. What God requires of us, the law of God. His Word provides us with nutrition. The Bible refers to this nutrition as both 
milk. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 2, for babes. And as meat as we mature. Notice Hebrews chapter 5. Peter tells us that newborn babes need that sincere milk of the Word. And then as we mature, we need to continue to enjoy milk. There's nothing wrong with some nutrition from milk. But we need to move on to maturity. And that is pointed out in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk. In other words... You are not growing from that, that babe status in Christ. You have come need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for his babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age or mature, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The power of life comes not just by hearing the Word of God and knowing the Word of God and being faithful to the Word of God. It comes by a continual studying of, of God's Word and growing and maturing in God's Word. Notice in verse 14 he says we need to use reason and exercise our senses. <laughs> right? A lot of folks, just as they want to eliminate the idea of a pattern from the Christian life, they want to eliminate reason from Christian life. They want to do something just because it feels good. But the Bible here says that we need to use our thinking ability. And that that thinking ability is part of the power that, can, that motivates us to do what we need to do. That purpose that God has given to us to keep His commandments and to follow that pattern and to achieve the prize, to keep our eyes on the goal. Outside of the vine, we can do nothing. Without that nutrition, without the use of our reasoning facilities, and without exercising those reasoning abilities, we can't grow, we can't mature. And if we do not, we do not accept the power that is necessary to move on. The initial power to save comes from God. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It is by the grace of God that we have the opportunity to hear the Word of God and believe it and obey it. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, he continues. <clears throat> verse 10, For we are His workmanship, <coughs> created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the beginning, the power belongs to Christ, for by grace are we saved through faith. But then, our walk with Christ requires the power of God. Because God has provided us with the way, the path that we should walk. In Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. Paul writes in verse 15, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God that leads man unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is God's word that gives us the power to be saved. 
And it is the power that can keep us saved. And therefore, when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, we know that we can be saved by obedience to the gospel and the power that we see from it and the power that Christ gave unto us to be freed from our sins and that he died on the cross and shed his blood so that we might have our sins washed away and and live free from that guilt and punishment. But then we can live according to the gospel to make sure that we have that blessing applied to our lives. The power of God that leads to salvation is the knowledge that, uh, that gives us the, the know-how to be right with God. The knowledge of how to be saved from our past sins and the knowledge to remain saved from our past sins. And so Christianity is meant to be a life that is lived, not something that we do from time to time. God created us to look like Him. He wants us to look like Him. He wants us to seek Him. He wants us to learn from Him. He wants us to love Him. And He wants us to show Him through our lives to others. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. How are they to glorify God? When we express the love of God and the, light and the God-like life that we live. And so we find purpose, we find a pattern, and we find the prize. But we also find the power that necessitate or that provides us uh, with the means to be saved and the means to remain saved. Any individual who, are, who is looking for fulfillment, who is looking to find the purpose of life, who is looking to answer questions to life's greatest questions, need only to open up the book, the greatest book ever written in the Bible. And if they will follow this simple outline, and perhaps we can help many by showing them this simple outline that is in the book of Philippians, where Jesus has provided us with everything we need to live the Christian life, to find fulfillment. Now, if people are looking for fulfillment in this life, in physical goods, in physical things, and in physical feelings, they won't find it because that's not where God put it. Fulfillment is to do the will of God and to reach for that high calling of God, that prize at the end of this life. And so for that reason, we must seek Christ and seek Him first. Because if we follow Him and we hear Him and we abide Him, we know our purpose, we know the pattern, we know the prize, and we know the power. And we can apply those to our lives and be saved in the end. The word that provides us with the power of knowledge tells us that by faith we are to hear his word and believe it, repent of our past sins and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And based on that evidence, we are to be baptized into his body where we can have our sins washed away. Acts 22 verse 16. God adds those obedient souls to his church, the church of Christ, and if we'll remain faithful in that church, doing what he says to do, following his pattern, seeking him and reaching forward to that goal, when Jesus returns, we'll be found faithful in him. And we will go home to be with him forever in heaven. And that's our goal today. We are also commanded to go into the world and teach the gospel to others, to bring this great news to others. And as long as we continue to do that, we, we fulfill our mission. If you've not yet started that walk with Christ today, the invitation is extended to you, but if you've already done so and have some other need in your life, we, we extend to you our helping hand if we can assist as we stand and sing.